be open, be vulnerable. I think sometimes players, uh, when you're a coach, if you, um, if a coach admits vulnerability, I think it gains a lot of respect. Hello, one and all. Welcome back to Retrospective. It's me and it's Chris, as usual. It's, you know, it's not going to change, unfortunately for you guys, perhaps. Um, <laughs> this week, we're joined by Kevin Sharp of Worcester County, uh, Worcestershire County Cricket Club. How are you, mate? I'm good, thank you. Looking forward to chatting to you guys. Thank you very much, mate. Well, <laughs> we um, appreciate your time. We got older Kev through a sort of an abstract source, really. My brother knows him, which is a weird one. Um, <laughs> through Via his former coaching days, I believe. Um, which was a, a very good good surprise, really. He rang me up the other day and he was like, oh yeah, do you want Kev Sharp on? I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, cracking, it's cracking stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, um, basically, for those of you who don't know Kev, um, give us a chat through basically a brief summary of what you do at the moment. Well, my title at the moment is Head of Coach and Player Development at Worcestershire County Cricket Club. Um, it's been a, a long journey for me from being a professional cricketer a long time ago now, 1976 to 1992 with Yorkshire. Um, my, my coaching and teaching career began just after that. And, you know, I, I've, I've gone through the ranks, really. I've been a, a coach in primary schools, disabled children, Shropshire Disabled Cricket Association, uh, secondary schools, youth teams, Bradford Leeds University, went back to Yorkshire as a coach, left Yorkshire, set up my own little business with a guy uh, on, on team building and coaching, and went, went back to Worcester seven years ago as batting coach stroke second team coach. Uh, I was head, made head coach in 2018, and subsequently now I've moved into a position of head of coach and player development. Did you, did you get all that? Yeah, that's a lot, a lot of stuff to cover, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, it's a hell of a lot to uh, to go through there. But uh, it 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 is so good stuff as always. It means you probably got plenty of stories to give to us, which is uh, what we're after. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So that's basically yeah, that, that's started, the, that's the present right now, Kev. So let's go all the way back to the start for you and where where your sort of career kicked off. Was it you know when you were a kid you noticed you wanted to go into the cricket world or something that you sort of fell into as an adult? No, my father played local club cricket, um, so, you know, uh, cricket was something on my radar from being a baby, really. Loved football as well. Big Leeds United fan from Leeds. <laughs> Could be worse. Um, hoping we're going to get promoted this year. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, we shall see. Uh, <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> um, but no, it was always cricket and football, and I enjoyed playing both. Um, probably... You know, by the time I got to 15, I, I was a better cricketer than a footballer. So it, it just took its natural course, really. Uh, but I always remember going down to the local club in Leeds where my dad played and always got a pair of pads on that were twice, you know, twice as twice the size as me, really. <laughs> and, um, and, and so just ball games were always, you know, something I wanted to do. Even at school, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd always be the first one out in the playground setting up a game of football or a game of cricket. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's, it's something that's pretty much ingrained into your blood almost. Yeah, I say so. I, you know, I wasn't very good at school. When I say I, was, when I, say I wasn't very good at school, I, I preferred the playground to the classroom. So I probably wasn't the best listener uh, in a classroom. And, and you know, it's, what's interesting about that is most of... My listening and, and learning has come later in life when I've been doing my coach education courses. Uh, I went and did a, an NLP master practitioner course uh, a few years ago, which was most helpful in my in my coaching career. You know, learning how to use language patterns and and communicate in a more positive way. Really. Yes. Yeah, so coaching is a it, it's it's quite a. Uh... A, a big role, obviously, for a lot of sports-related things. There's a lot of facets to it. Um, so what was it that sort of made you uh, become a coach? Because obviously it's something that you take on sort of either, you know, in the latter part of your sporting career or something you do, you know, after picking up uh, a, a, um, a, a course almost. So where was it you felt like you, you wanted to be a coach? It happened by accident, really. Um, 
at the back end of my playing career with Yorkshire, I was given only a few days' notice that I would be leaving the club. And I was, at the time, in my last year in 1992, I was like second 11 captain. Mm. And Yorkshire had traditionally always had a, a senior player as, as captain leading the second 11. And I was kind of under the, the impression that that might continue. However, it didn't. And, you know, I was within a few days towards the end of the season, I, I was told I didn't have a job anymore. Mm. The following week, uh, I was booked on my, um, what was then the level three coaching course. Oh, it was the advanced coaching course at Lillyshaw at the National Sports Centre in Shropshire. So I went on that course uh, pretty much unemployed with a young family. And it was quite a tough time. And during the course of that week, um, I was, you know, chatting to a lot of people and um, a great sort of support for me over the years has been a guy called Gordon Lord who ran uh, coach education for ECB level four for many years uh, in the sort of early 2000s, right up to recent times. And Gordon had been a, a development officer in Shropshire the year before, and he was moving to Edgebaston to work for the Test and County Cricket Board then before it came the, became the ECB. And he fixed me up to go uh, and work uh, for Telford and Reeking Council in Shropshire for uh, initially a six month period. And all that, that was very much, it wasn't just coaching, it was, you know, like I say, I was involved in primary schools, disabled children and, and, and secondary schools and clubs and so so my, t my teaching and coaching career began at grassroots level really but it happened by accident you know I know it was in those days really you know so professional cricket, cricketers didn't always think about the future you didn't mm. always sort of have a plan if you like of what might happen next after you'd finished playing and uh, th that was certainly the case for me. I was kind of anticipating being second 11 captain for a, a while longer and suddenly it wasn't there anymore and you, you had to think on your feet and, and get on with it. And of course, nowadays they've got all the PCA support officers, the welfare officers, sports psychologists who are help, help the guys to prepare for what comes next. But, you know, there wasn't much of that around in those days. It was very much sink or swim, really. Yeah. Um, so you've been in the coaching game for a very, very long time. Um, so what what sort of changes have you seen in the way that people coach from obviously the grassroots level? You still probably have a little bit of to do with that. And then up at the top level. Uh, well, it's very different. You know, I, mean, uh, I suppose the difference is, is the way you manage people. At grassroots level with younger people it's probably a bit more of a tell you know you're more sort of telling and explaining a little bit more about what you're asking from people I think at, in, at the professional level having been a you know having been a uh, first team coach uh, I did a year at Yorkshire as a first team coach and I, I did a year at Worcester as a first team coach and it's it's very much more about managing people and I think, you know, understanding people and recognising that everybody's different. You know, not everybody ticks in the same way. The same message for one person may not work for another. So it's, I think for me, I, I've always based my philosophy of coaching about, around building relationships and trust. And, and that takes time. You know, that's not something that can be done overnight, of course. Um, but it's something that can be knocked down overnight if you say or do the wrong thing. So I think that's been my philosophy of coaching and, and, and you know, having good trusting relationships with people, not always easy, particularly at first team coach level, because the hardest thing is selection. Mm. You know, if you leave players out of the team, uh, it's not easy. And, uh, but I always kind of tried to make sure that if we were leaving a player out, that they were given an explanation. Whether they liked it or not, they would be given a, a reason for why they weren't in the team. And I always felt, looking back as a player, that as long as I was given some form of explanation why I wasn't playing, that 
even if I didn't like it, I would always respect that. The worst thing for a player is to be told he's not playing and not told anything. You know, because he would he would think, well, have I done something wrong? What am I doing wrong? So I think it's important. To, the communication is so, so important. So, so important. So I think what's interesting for me now is that I work at all levels now. So it's almost like I'm still, as a you know, head of coaching and player development, I, have a, I still coach and support the first 11 at Worcester, as well as and all the professionals. Now it, it spreads into academy pathways, women and girls. So I have a, you know, I have relationships and inputs with coaches at the under 11s, as well as the first team coaches at Worcestershire. And that kind of, I suppose that I, I, I would, I would say that my experience over the years has has put me in that position to, to, to be able to do that. And, and, and the one thing I love more than anything is what I call the cradle to the grave. I love seeing the 12 year old walk through the door, the talented young player and having the opportunity to work with him through his development or her through their development and see them go on and play, you know, internationals or first team cricket. You know, one of those who uh, a very close relationship was Joe Root, obviously the current England captain. I mean, Joe Root walked through the door at Yorkshire as a 12-year-old. And, you know, I was lucky enough to be part of his journey all the way through to him playing professional cricket before I left, you know, first-team cricket before I left Yorkshire. And I kind of, I love those things. Absolutely, mate. And what, what, one thing I wanted to touch on is that would you say nowadays coaching is as much, especially at the top level, is as much psychological as it is technical? Oh, mental by far the biggest percentage. I think it's, it's fair to say that, you know, everybody who gets to be a professional cricketer is good at cricket. Whether you, you know, whether you're youth cricketer, under 15s, under 17s, academies, you are good at, you're good at your sport. And then the difference comes for me in what, what we say in Yorkshire is the top four inch, we would say. And what goes on up there, because, you know, as you, we start, when we start playing the game, you know, when we look back, it's all fun and enjoyment. Why did you start playing cricket? Why did you start playing football? Because it's fun and we enjoy it. And the problem lies sometimes, particularly when you get to play professionally, that it can stop being fun anymore. It's because you're playing for a living and you, you know, you've know you got perhaps a house to, to pay for or a car to pay for and bills to pay. And, and if, you're not, if it's not going well, you worry more and it becomes baggage can build up so it's kind of like for me it's the ones who the ones who are not necessarily actually technically the most talented who go on and make it all the way and that's because they are been able to mentally put things in perspective probably better than some others yeah Definitely. one thing i wanted i'm oh, sorry carry on okay, but i didn't mean to interrupt <laughs> no, no, <you're> <laughs> Um, what I was going to say was, do you find nowadays in the modern day with technology and social media, it's harder to coach in that psychological aspect than it was, say, prior to that being, you know, quite a, a prevalent thing? No, I don't think so. I think that there's more, I think there's more challenges for players now. There's, there's, absolutely, there's more challenges. I mean, social media, for example, I mean, a, a player can't get away with anything, can he? Mm. Back in the day, when I was a, a lad, you know, we, you know, you could maybe have a few beers and go out and not get caught. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, I think nowadays, I'm in a way, I'm glad that that I played in the era I did. It was, it was very sociable in those days, and you know, the media were often quite close to the players, and there wasn't, you know. You didn't, you didn't get in trouble like lads do now. You know, I mean, you, 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 
a footballer or a, a big name cricketer goes out now and misbehaves in any sh shape or form, the, the whole world can see it. And so it's difficult for them. They have to be on the ball. You have to be aware, really aware of, of all those sort of uh, things that can happen away from the plane of the game, socially. And so I would say that, you know, probably now that, you know, mental health is, is not the issue that it used to be. You know, we've got sports psychologists, we've got PCA welfare workers, we've got players openly in all, form, all forms of sport, openly talking about, um, you know, struggling with confidence and self-belief and depression. Mm. And back in the day, I mean, I suffered, I know I suffered from forms of depression over the years. But you never talked about it. It's almost like you would feel as a, as a male in, a, in, a, in that harsh sporting environment that, you know, you'd feel scared to talk about it. You'd think you were, people would think you were a bit mad or, you know, vulnerable, so we shouldn't be playing or, or it might affect selection and all those things. But players are more open to that now and it's not kind of like um, such an issue anymore. I mean, mm. the, one of the best books I've read on from a player is Marcus Dostothic. Mm. He yeah. wrote, his book was, I just thought it was awesome. It was fantastic. He talked about, you know, he had problems going overseas and, and, and playing and being away from home and, and, and very complex. And he, he was one of the first players, I think, to really come out and talk about some of those issues. And I think what he did would, would, would have been very helpful for, for many people. And, you know, of late, people, you know, you see, we've only got to look at social media now or look at the telly and sports people are talking about mental health. Mm. And there's more support for it. So, and, you know, let's be, like, I think it would be fair to say that stress is probably one of the things that keeps people off work more than anything else nowadays. Absolutely, mate. Right. Um, so you talk, talked about openly discussing mental health has there ever been any situations and i don't want to name any names because you know that's that's their private things but have there been any situations where you've had to deal personally with another player feeling down depressed about say selection or just general life things that you've had to deal with in your coaching career yeah plenty because we're human beings um and we're vulnerable and Often, I think that sports people uh, are put on a pedestal, and probably people think that you know they're they're not vulnerable. But of course, everybody is. Uh, you know, that we're human beings, and and I think lack lack of confidence and anxiety are very common. Absolutely, very very common, and I I think that you know I mean obviously individuals are different and some people would find it easier to communicate that than than, than than some others but i think i've been lucky enough i'd like, like to say going back to my philosophy of coaching and perhaps it's in my nature as well is that i i, I think i'm quite a having had some tough experiences myself reasonably well qualified to understand what some of these young guys go through when they're growing up from in teenagers into having some real, you know, responsibilities when marriages and, and, and bills to pay come along. So I think that's, for me, I, I, I think I, I've been lucky enough to have had good relationships on the whole with players across my career. And, and, and probably I feel as though there's a good number of players have felt comfortable in talking to me about some of their vulnerability. And, and I think this is an interesting one because I've, as a coach, I've probably been most uncomfortable when I've been in the head coach position because you're slightly isolated a little bit then because you are the, the man who picks the team with the captain or, and you're the man who might have more influence on a player's contract. 
whether he gets an extension or he doesn't. I, when I was been in the head coach position, I felt myself a little bit more isolated from the group than I did when I was like second eleven coach or and batting coach, because I think I was I've been always at my best when I've had a foot in both camps, if you like, yeah. a foot in the players' camp and a foot in the coaches' camp. And that means that what it's meant is that probably, and particularly for first eleven, you're not involved in directly involved in selection. So then, guys feel as though they can trust you and talk to you and share their feelings. But nine times out of ten, that would stay between me and the player. I wouldn't share that with the head coach unless I felt it absolutely necessary. And if mm -hmm. I did, I'd often tell the player that I'm going to share this. Just so we need to, for this reason. So, I think, you know, like, the position I'm in now, actually, suits me down to the ground, because I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm almost like a, a floating person without, I don't pick the first team now. The captain and the head coach pick the first team. Uh, and if somebody's left out of that first team, who might be finding it difficult, my role allows me to communicate with them and, 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 and help them get back in the team. Absolutely. I found it hard, it's leaving somebody out and somebody's sulking a bit with you because you'd left them out. And you may have a good relationship with them. I, I found those things the most difficult. And I think that's just down to my personality. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not for your option, man, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to ask is you, when you do have those sort of uh, fallouts of players and stuff over your career, how did you uh, best deal with those things? So obviously, you said mentioned before that you give them the reasoning behind your decisions and stuff. Uh, sometimes that isn't always the end of it, I'd imagine. Sometimes, you know, there's still a bit more of an escalation behind that. So as a coach, you know, what is it, what's the best way to deal with players <clears> who are in a sense, peed off of the decision beyond um, what well, you I, look at, when I did a year at Yorkshire as a as first-team coach, but it was too early in my career. I'd only just gone back to the club as initially as batting coach. And um, they released the, the, the first-team coach just before the start of the season. And I was asked to take on the role, but I'd been out of the game, the first-class game, for eight years. I've been working in Shropshire in development. I've been the Leeds and Leeds Bradford University coach for two years. But to go back into the professional game was great because I went in as batting coach, but within a couple of months, I was asked to take on the first 11. And it was too early, it was too soon. And I'd, there was quite a lot of uh, high profile cricketers in that Yorkshire team at that point. People like Darren Goff, Michael Vaughan, Matthew Hoggard, Ryan Sidebottom, Chris Silverwood, who's now currently England coach, Anthony McGrath, Matthew Wood, Steve Kirby. There was a lot of experience. And, and it was, I had some difficult, um, difficult times with, with, with one or two of those lads because, I, and I didn't manage it particularly well, to be honest. But, and the reason for that, I now know is, I wasn't ready for that at that point. I'd been out of the game for eight years. I was not ready for that position. And I actually told the um, director of cricket that at that point and the chairman. And and then then I was put back into the position where I should have been, and that was as batting coach of the club. And then from there on uh, at Yorkshire, I was at batting coach, second 11 coach. And when I've gone to Worcester, I've done a similar role. But I was in a better place when I was made first team coach, head coach at Worcestershire. Absolutely. Two years ago, because of, because of all the experiences. And I, and I, I knew when, when I was asked, actually, to take on the role, I knew how tough it was going to be for me. I knew it'd be really difficult. Some of the challenges would be uh, ones that I wouldn't find easy. And that, that not so much people management, but the, the those real disappointing selection issues more than anything else and people's careers 
you know, because a bloke might get left out of the team and he thinks that, well, it's, I'm in the last year of my contract. Does that mean, I, you know, does that, what does that mean? So I knew I'd find those difficult, but I promised myself one thing uh, was that I would not dodge any difficult decision. If I had to tell somebody something or make a decision, I would not try and get out through the back door, if you like. And mm -hmm. I, I'm proud to say that all through that season, um, that's what happened. I mean, one of the most difficult ones, the most difficult decision I ever had to make was uh, the week before the T20 finals there that we won at Edgebaston, when we beat Sussex in the final, I left Ben Cox, the wicketkeeper, out of the team, out of the championship team. And uh, it'd been a, a decision that I would toiled with and toiled with for a little while. And, you know, people were saying to me, I was saying to, to one or two people closer to me that, uh, you know, basically Ben had been injured for a little while and a, a lad had come in, Alex Milton had come in and done a fantastic job and made a hundred on his debut and so and then Ben came back and probably at that time Ben's you know he, he was for him he was underachieving a little bit with the bat and so there was a it, it was a very difficult decision but my gut feeling told me that it was the best thing to go people were telling me that what happens at, well he was definitely playing in finals day in T20 because he's one of our leading players this was championship cricket and people were saying, well, you know, it might affect him in finals day and that sort of thing. And I couldn't sleep. But I made the decision that I thought was right. And he, and he was left out that week. And he wasn't happy, understandably. He's a professional. He, he, you know, he was a, a very strong, he's a very strong player for Worcestershire. Um, but he took it on the chin. He went and practiced properly. He played a second 11 game that week and made a 100. And... Uh, he came back and won man of the match in both days, in both games and in, in finals day. He played brilliantly and, you know, good for him. It was just a, a great sort of way of responding and saying, up yours, coach, without saying it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, yeah. Just to finish on that, that, you know, I think that Ben challenged me very hard on the reasons why. And it was tough. Uh, anyway, it's like I said, I, I, I gave him the reasons and whether he liked it or not, he took it on the chin. And, you know, we're best mates again now. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> but for me, those things are were really, really tough. And I found myself, you know, for the... And it hasn't happened very often that I'd be laid in bed that week, awake at night, thinking, oh, man, I hope... I hope it doesn't make a mess of him for next Saturday in finals day. And you know what? It didn't. Because he came back and played brilliantly. Absolutely. Well, there we go. So moving on, you, you mentioned Worcester, obviously the unbelievable uh, T20 win uh, in 2018. Um, so what's it like working alongside and a guy that I respect a lot um, and a lot of people in England just absolutely adore in Moe Nally. Um, a, a real leader um, and a, a wonderfully talented cricketer. What's it like having him as, as your captain there? Well, he's, he's, a, he's a legend. He's a, he's a cult figure, isn't he? Everybody, yeah. everybody loves Mo and he loves Worcestershire. And when he comes back to us, it just gives everybody a, a lift. He's just a great guy. He's got a wonderful sense of humour. He's... The lads think the world of him. They think the world of him. And he, come, he walks into that dressing room and it just gives everybody confidence. And he's so level. You know, whether he's playing well or whether he's, if he's had a good day or he's had a not so good day, you'd never know. He's just the same. And, you know, his leadership in the T20 campaign was so calming. And, you know, I'll never, ever forget, he gave... The best team chat I've ever heard the day before finals day. We, we had the opportunity to go to Edgebaston and practice on Friday and stay overnight in Birmingham and then obviously 
because we were on first in the morning. We played Lancashire in the first game. But we decided that what we'd do is practice at New Road, drive up in the afternoon and stay in Birmingham and then crack on Saturday morning. And we had a, a big squad at New Road that morning. You know, like 20 players and all the coaching staff and support staff. And just before we resumed training, Moen just called everybody in just for a quick chat. And uh, we were all in the old group huddle, you know, in the old circle, and everybody's looking at Mo. And he didn't say anything. He just looked at everybody, man for man. He just looked around the group, at everybody in their eyes, one by one. It took him about two minutes. It was, it was fantastic. And then all he said was, I expect everybody to think they're going to play two games tomorrow. And that was it. And he said, right, we'll practice now and we'll have a, a little brief chat before we start playing tomorrow morning. We've done all the homework on the opposition. Everything had been done. We knew we were playing, we knew the opposition players. The, the, the beauty about the Worcester team now is that we are a very, very good one-day team. You know, we're one of the, you know, we've been to T20 finals twice in two years. We've won it. We've lost off the last ball last year, which could have gone either way. We've been in a semi-final and two, two semis and a quarter final of the 50 over comp in the last three years, three or four years. So we, we, we're very good at white ball cricket and everybody knows their role. But just going back to Mo, he, you know, the way he captained the team and his calmness and composure and his smart tactical thinking is, well, it's just brilliant. You know, so gifted. I mean, when you look at, I mean, I'm just trying to think of one innings in particular, say, then that semi-final at Sussex last year when all, you know, their wicketkeeper dropped him. It's quite a straightforward catch, or it looked as a quite a straightforward catch early on. And then Moen went on to make a, you know, made a hundred, didn't he? Yeah. And unbelievable. And it was like, wow! It was just like, you know, he's a match winner, isn't he? Yeah, quite a quality quality player and someone that doesn't get too carried away. And I think that's something that we try and do, even in whatever we do, is try not to get too carried away with the success, too disparate with the with the with the lows. Um, so we usually go quite linear uh, in in retrospective. We usually start at the beginning and go to the end. But I think it, for you, what what inspiration have you did you take from your playing career um, and bring into your into your coaching career because you played alongside some cracking names. Yeah, well, look, I mean, uh, I mean, there were some quite big names in the Yorkshire team. Jeff Boycott probably been the, the biggest. I mean, I yeah. played with Jeff for 10 years and, you know, I, I, at one point I lived quite near him. So we used to travel together quite a lot together. I, I used to drive his BMW, which <laughs> I used to love because, you know, that, that was quite a big thing in them days for a young man's <laughs> BMW. Yeah. Uh, but I think... You know, it was a, it was a, a really sort of to the, you know, there was a guy called John Hampshire, uh, Chris Old, David Bairstow, obviously. John uh, Stout, yeah. Who's sadly not with us anymore. Arnie Sidebottom, he played professional football, Ryan's father. Um, Jeff Cope, he played uh, for England as an off spinner. Um, Richard Lum, Michael's father. Delathy, who went on to play for England. Um, you know, lots of, you know, quite a, quite a strong team. I, I, interestingly enough, it was at the era where overseas players had started coming into the other counties, and like in the sixties, Yorkshire and Surrey were like the two strongest teams. But once we got to mid seventies, and all these overseas players had started coming in, like two players per county, they, they suddenly got stronger. But of course, we had the Yorkshire tradition of Yorkshire born and bred. So we didn't have any, I mean, we didn't have an overseas player until 1992 when Sachin Tendulkar came to Yorkshire as the first first overseas player. But, it, it, you know, you didn't, you just kind of got on with it. It wasn't a place for the faint-hearted. And I, I think the one thing that I've taken from it more than anything else is that, is that when I was struggling, mentally struggling, 
I didn't feel as though I had anybody really to talk to and communicate with. And you, it was like sink or swim. Get on with it or get out of it. And I can remember thinking when I went into the coaching world is that I don't, if I'm working with some players, I don't, I don't want them to go through what I've been through. I want to be able to maybe help them pick up some of those pieces and help them put them, that jigsaw back together a little bit. You know, there were some wonderful days at Yorkshire. We had some, 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 some great days, but there's bits of it I wouldn't want back again. Mm. You know, some of the difficult stuff. You're kind of glad you went through it because I think going through some pain and, and concerns and worries, actually, in the end, actually make you wiser and stronger. You know, it's kind of like, well, sometimes when you're young, you, you're going through um, situations and difficulties for the first time. You've never experienced them before. Where am I? What's this? And that's hard. I know that's very hard through personal experience. And of course, what happens when you get a bit older is that when things crop up or difficulties crop up, crop up you've, you've kind of worn the t-shirt a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been there before. I, I know how to, perhaps I know how to manage this. You know, so, but I think, I think that's the thing for me more than anything is, is that you can never replace the adrenaline of playing. And, no. you know, it's in that boundary or making a hundred taking that great catch, all those in front of the crowd or on TV. Those, you know, the adrenaline of that, getting ready for a game is, is, is like, you know, the anxiety, the, the excitement, all of the things that go with it. You, you don't get that to the same degree as a coach. And I think this is why, you know, I know lots of people have struggled when they come out of the game because you can't replace those things. You, but, you know, for me personally, I've taken some great satisfaction of of um, of knowing that I've played a small part in, 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 in lots of players' journey. I mean, one of the, you know, like, some, sometimes people have asked me, what's, what's your greatest moment as a coach? And, you know, there's been, particularly I remember when I first went back to Yorkshire, um, before I went back as on, as, a, as, a, as an employee, I was at Leeds Bradford University and there's a guy called Anthony McGrath who's now the head coach at Essex, who I, I, I met and started to get to know before I went back to Yorkshire, met him by accident really, and he asked me if we could do some work together. So I started doing some, some work on his batting and we, we finished up coming over to see me as, as often as he could during the course of that season and he started to do to, to do well. And Yorkshire got to the final of the C and G, I think it was, and 50 over competition at the end of the season against Somerset. And Magsy gave me his four tickets for the game and he paid for the rest of his family tickets. And he gave me his four tickets. He says, I just want to say thank you for helping me. And do you want do you want to go to Lords? I said, yeah. So, you know, my wife and I and and um, two friends we went to Lords for for the weekend. And Magsy, along with Australian Matthew Elliott, won Yorkshire the game. Magsy got fifty odd in the end, and it was a brilliant day. And we were sat with all the Yorkshire members, and within a minute of him getting off the field, having won the, the game. I got a text from him just to say that, I just want to say thank you. He says, if, if, if it hadn't have been for your support, this wouldn't have happened today. Thanks very much. And, and moments like that are something you'll never forget. You know, you never forget. I mean, uh, another great moment was uh, um, when Joe Root was 14 years old, I had a bit of fun with him one day and I said, you know, when you're playing for England, you, aren't you? you won't forget me, will you? You leave me two tickets on the gate at Lawrence. <laughs> he said, of course I will. As if it was going to happen. 
<laughs> as if it was going to happen. <laughs> and then when he got picked in his first test match, I got a text from him uh, after his first test. So he got he was played in India in his first, but that summer, early that summer, he said he's coming to Lord to watch me. We need to fulfil our um, our deal. And I, I turned him down. <laughs> <laughs> I just started at Worcester, and I I just started my job there, and you know I was. Just didn't tie up. Anyway, the bottom line is for about three years, it, it sent me a message every year saying, when are you coming to Lords to watch when we're going to fulfill our deal? And I turned him down for about three years, three or four years. And then uh, a couple of years back, his little son was born, Alfie. So I sent him a message. And of course, he sent me a picture back of little Alfie a week old with a cricket bat in his hand. <laughs> and he said, um, when he come into Lords, so I just thought I've got to go. On. I've got to go. This is just like wow, got to go. Anyway, so I sent a message him back. I looked at the fixture list, and England were playing South Africa early June at Lords first first um, first game of the series. And uh, I messaged him back. I says I'll be there. Two tickets, please. Full hospitality. I'm looking after for the day. So I said right, and then unbelievably. Two months later, uh, Alistair Cook res- um, finished his captaincy and Joe was made captain. So on that, we, we went to Lords from Worcester on that day and it was his first day as England captain. And he made 180. <laughs> and we sat all day with um, his mum and dad and granddad and, and you know, his little lad and missus. And it, 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 it was fantastic and went on the... I got a call from Test Match Special um, uh, on the way down on the train to ask if I'd go on with John Agnew, Jonathan Agnew, uh, at lunchtime with his granddad and his dad just to talk about Joe's early days. So it was a fantastic day and it was a dream because, you know, it's kind of like, well, he made 180 and it was his first day as captain and we just fulfilled our our promise. But, you know, I'm, I'm at Worcester now and, I mean, the thing is about those lads, they still keep in touch. McGrath, Root, you know, they still keep in touch. And that's nice. And that shows you that, you know, you've got real strong, close relationships with these with these guys. But, you know, I've been at Worcester seven years now and I've built some fantastic relationships here. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful to see guys, you know, coming through again that academy. Which and then seeing them now develop through into first team cricket, and you know we've got one or two young players here at Worcester that have got every chance of going all the way. So I've had that experience in another county, and I feel very grateful for that. Because when I left Yorkshire in two thousand and eleven, I felt it was too early. You know they restructured the coaching department. I finished up leaving, and I felt as though I'd had my legs cut off really. I felt as though I got some more to offer and I wasn't ready to leave again. But I had to for a couple of years. And then Steve Rhodes rang me one day and asked me if I could come and help out at Worcester. And it, it started with a couple of days a week. Um, it developed into a six month contract. And here I am, live on the edge of Worcester now, seven years later and work for a, a, a fantastic cricket club. Absolutely, and it's you, you, they're going from from strength to strength. Um, the last one from me, last question from me is: uh, What advice would you give to a young Kevin Sharp in well, younger Kevin Sharp in 1992, uh, just going into into coaching? What what would your advice be? CPD, get as much knowledge as you can. Uh, learn, learn, learn. Find out. Talk to people. Have experiences. I mean, level four was just a revelation. You know, for me, you, you, you'd go and you'd mix with your peer group, fellow coaches. You'd, you'd go for three or four day modules. You got the tutoring, the information that came your way. Some of it you'll use, some of it you won't. I think the important thing is to have an open mind to education and experiences and never think you know everything. But you don't. Uh, you can learn, you learn every day. You, should, you can learn something every day. I mean, I'm, 
bit of an old bugger now, but you know, there's always something that comes along and you think, whoa, yeah, that would never have thought it like that, or you know. So uh, education, 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 learn, learn, learn. Be admit vulnerability. Um, you're not always right. None of us are always right. We've got an, we've got an opinion. Things are subjective often. Uh, be open, be vulnerable. I think sometimes players, uh, when you're a coach, if you, um, if a coach admits vulnerability, I think it gains a lot of respect. You know, and players would feel comfortable in perhaps reciprocating that. Does that answer the question? I think so. I think so. Anything more from Haas? Yeah, just to find one for me. What does the uh, the future hold for Kev Sharp going forward? Is there any particular <laughs> avenues you want to explore still or are you happy as you are? Well, I'm 61 now and um, I still love going to work. <laughs> you know, I've got a lovely... I work for a lovely cricket club. I, I sit here now and I can see the Malvern Hills over there. And I think, well, this is... And, you know, I love the... I love the people I work with um, and I've got a job that I I think the job I've got is what I'm best at doing and that is supporting and working with people and, and, and giving back your knowledge and I can do that right across the club and the club trusts me to do that so I'm, I, find, I think it's a bit special so you know Longer term, I, I want to do some travelling. I want to, if we can, don't know if we can fly anymore for a good few years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> everything, everything that's been going on this last few months. But uh, I think that initially it's to continue enjoying what I'm doing. And, you know, in a couple of years' time, perhaps see where we're at. I, I don't want to leave. I want to go to New Zealand for about six weeks. That'd be nice. Uh, mm. Because I went there as a, um, as a kid on a tour, a Derek Robbins tour in 1980, which is 40 years ago. And travelled right through the islands, but probably didn't appreciate the islands as, and the scenery as, as much. Played cricket, but, you know, it was a, a, some 20-year-olds having a few beers and playing some cricket. <laughs> uh, but my wife and I would like to go to New Zealand for six or eight weeks and just travel and... You know, just see that we've got a bucket list of places in the world that we'd like to visit. And I don't want to leave that till I'm too old. I can't do it. But but at the moment, I think in for the next two to three years, I think I don't have any other wish list than to carry on doing what I'm doing. And I, and I think as long as I feel as though I'm contributing and making an impact. I mean, the one thing I can't do as much is the physical stuff now. You know, this flicker that they have now, I can't. I can't oh, no. Nah. I which, can't do that one. <laughs> <laughs> which coaches have to do, but, but that's kind of okay. With, you know, uh, there's other bits you can offer. Um, I did do the... Did you, did you see we did this rapid relay for Acorns Hospice the other week? No, well, I didn't see that. Yeah, well, basically, about three weeks ago, uh, we as a club undertook a... Uh, what we call a rapid relay was we're from nine, from uh, eight o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night uh, for a week. Everybody either ran or cycled uh, for an hour, and so you had different slots. And I had two one-hour slots during that week, and I've never done anything but walk for 15, 20 years. <laughs> but I to jog around for a my two one hour slots and god it was hard it was so <laughs> hard and however it's for a good cause and we made about you know about 15 grand for acorns children's hospice in worcester so it was a, a really good thing to do mm. excellent stuff has can relate to that he got beat in a race by his mum the other day i so. did yeah <laughs> i got no exercise for 12 weeks and then i thought oh i can get out and run it's fine so i went out <laughs> So my mom runs regularly and she does dancing and stuff like that. So she's pretty active in that sense. So I thought, well, if she can run, I can run. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, off I ventured about two miles in. I was like, I am knackered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. If, especially if you don't do it. Yeah, no, no I'm not, I've not done any exercise for 
you know, we're nearing on three months at this stage now. Um, so yeah, it was a bit of a slap in the face, but we there move we on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, um, You'll have to get over it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'm going to try it again once my legs have stopped hurting from two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we go. Um, that's a wonderful end to another wonderful episode of Retrospective. Massive thanks to Kev for joining us. Uh, really good to learn. We, we, we love learning from, from new people on, on this series. We've, got, we've had a vast, strange variety of people. Yeah, real, um, real mix. So up, it, amazing stuff. Um, anything that you'd like to shout out social media wise, Kev? Or are you all good with that? No, what happens? What happens? What, does this go out on your YouTube channel? It or? will do, yeah. yeah. It will do, yeah. Oh well, if you if you put something out, are you putting something out on social media? Yeah, yeah. What what shall we what shall we tag you? What, what's your uh, Twitter or whatever? Uh, Sharpie Kev. Sharpie Kev, right? Oh, Ever, yeah. Everyone go follow. Okay. <laughs> everyone go bombard Kev. <laughs> I quite enjoy Twitter actually. I think it's it's I, I quite I quite like it. I think there's you know it's good you know, snippets of information, isn't it? Yeah, cricket Twitter's a lot more healthy than football Twitter is. Uh, oh for yeah. sure. So for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've just got a new follower. Yeah, well, yeah that'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> stuff. Anyway, uh, Hass, anything else you'd like to uh say? Uh, the seventy percent of you that are watching this that aren't subscribed, press the button. It helps us out. <laughs> yeah, seventy percent of you that aren't subscribed, so please, please subscribe. Um, and if, and that's about it. Um, thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next time.